Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri in the USA. Well, today we've got a couple of small cassette decks to fix up, put some new belts on, clean them up, and get them working again. The first is this realistic Mini Set 9. At least take regular compact cassettes. They're made to be small and portable, and a lot of these were sold for use with pocket computers or home computers and they have the three requisite connections needed for that. We also have a Sharp CE122 which was sold for use with Sharp pocket computers. It's in a nice little carrying case here. It's in pretty good shape and it also has all the needed connections here on the side. So I already took these apart and measured the belt so I could get those ordered and now we need to take these apart and clean them and get those belts put on there and try them out. So let's get started. I originally thought this was going to be a simple repair on each deck, just replacing the belts and cleaning them up. Uh, each had their own surprises in store though, and it made the whole repair process a lot longer and it made the video about twice as long as I thought it would be. But I think it's important to show how things don't always go the way you plan and sometimes you make mistakes and you've got to figure out how to correct for those mistakes. So here we go. We'll see what happens. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They do circuit boards of all sizes, small circuit boards, medium circuit boards. They can even assemble them for you. Are you a maker who likes sharing your ideas with other makers? If so, you can submit your articles to the monthly submission for PCBWA and earn coupons and notary titles. Check out the link in the description below. Well, how about we start with our Mini Set 9. This is a realistic branded, it's from Radio Shack. It's in pretty good shape. It's got a few little scuffs here and there, uh, but not too bad. I noticed that somebody had marked red on here. Usually the mic cable for use with the computer connections is red. So they marked it on there so they know where to hook it. Uh, the battery terminals are good. This little foam here is kind of breaking down. So I'll have to replace that. Now, what I did when I took these apart, um, for the mini set I actually found uh, belt links listed somewhere on the internet so that saved a little bit of time but I went ahead and measured the cross section so I had something to compare. For the sharp I took it apart and I made a drawing of how the belts were routed. I photographed both of these and then I actually cut the belts off so I could measure the length and take into account how much they might have stretched with time. And I've got my belts here. I'll put a list of these belts in the description below in case you want to work on one of these. And there's just a few screws here to take this thing apart. Okay. There we go. That just comes off like that. All of this dirtiness here is just from the belt aging. There's some glue from having the rubber bits held on. All the belts are out here in the open, uh, pretty much so, which makes it nice and convenient. We do need to get into this one, which drives the cap stand. So we've got this belt, which is for the tape counter. We've got this one, which comes from the motor to the flywheel. And there's another one for the flywheel that runs around to the cap stands. So what we'll have to see here is how much of this we have to take apart to get to that tricky belt. I think we'll just take this tape counter belt off and it looks like to me there is one screw here and one here that hold this board on. This wire that runs all the way over here but it looks like we can slip it down. This wire we may have to desolder or we might be able to move the whole board that way enough and we've got this little RF shield thing here. Well, this is actually like riveted to this metalized cardboard and soldered to the board. 
That's curious, but there's nothing under it. Now well, these two wires go to this little switch right here, which seems pretty loose. So once we get this board loose, we might be able to set it forward and slide that switch up and not have to remove the wire. Oops, not that screw, this screw. Okay, that is a plastic type screw. This has a wider top. It's like a pan head and it's a machine screw. Now, our switch here will kind of come off of there. It's hooked over that post with the legs going that way. And there we go. We can slide him out of the way enough like that. Now my goal with this is to make this unit functional again, not to tear it to bits. Chuck Hutchin has done some videos where he's completely refurbished old cassette decks, taking them completely to bits. I will put a link to his videos below. They are well worth a watch. Okay, I think if we take this top plate off, uh, we might be able to slide it out that way. Notice it's got a little paint lock on here. Okay. And yes, that will slide that way. It just has a little plastic bearing plate on there, which went on top of the flywheel. Now we can pull off this motor belt. And yeah, it's definitely stretched with age, but it hasn't turned to goo, which makes our job easier. And we'll do a bit of studying on how this belt is routed. It goes on the bottom side of the flywheel, over the top of this idler, over there, and then over this gear. Yeah, I think we can slip him off like this. Yeah, this belt feels rather crusty. We can just lift, lift that up out of the way. Yeah, also not gooey, but rather, rather crusty. Okay, I said belt three was for the cap stands. That is this. It's got a 48 thousandths cross section, which is a little bigger than a millimeter. And it's 7.4 inches long. The company that makes these um, has a nice PDF that lists all these sizes. And their naming convention didn't make much sense to me until I looked at the whole PDF. And then it made sense. It's actually a very simple system. Even if you're not fond of inch measurements, you'll find it's not too hard to get along with. Okay. Yeah, we went there. And we can rotate this a few times by hand after we get it together and that'll uh, get it all squared up on the pulleys it should be on. I'm taking a peek under here now and we are on the proper place there. So I'm just going to rotate this around and if we got a twist in the belt it'll work itself out. And that looks really good. Okay, so our motor belt is belt two, which is this guy. It has a 46 thousandths wall and it's seven inches long. And yes, you can buy a whole handful of random belts, you know, from eBay and Amazon for 15 bucks. Um, I always hesitate to do that because no idea what quality they are or if you're ever going to get the right size that you really need. And if I want to take something apart and fix it, I would rather just do it once and know that I used a quality part on it. And these are, you know, like 
three bucks a piece. So we're not talking about high finance here to fix it right. There we go. Okay. Now we can rotate our board back around like so. Put our little switch back where he lives like that. Okay, the board looks like it's at home there. It looks like it's at home there. Our switch looks reasonable. We had this screw here. Oh no. That's a disaster. This post was actually shattered. Hmm. See, this whole corner is shattered out of that. Okay. Well, now I'm going to have to stop filming and think of how to fix that post, and then we'll pick it back up. I filled a little syringe with some acetone and I first glued this broken piece here. It was kind of separated from there, clamped it down. It was like that over here too. And then I fitted in all the little broken pieces I could find to kind of head this wedge shaped piece here and part of this wall. So we've got this much of the original structure in there as I could find. Um, I went ahead and pulled it the rest of the way out of the case out of doing that because it was already 90% there. You know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So we'll set this aside and let everything cure and then we'll come back in and use some baking soda and super glue to build in the missing parts of the structure so we've got a place to put a screw. And while this is curing, then we can go ahead and clean up the rest of the case and get rid of that crumbling foam and that type of thing. And really all this staining in here is just from the belts aging. I think I've got some Formula 409 in this little squirt bottle. I'm going to just clean it all the little crumbs out of there that have collected over the years. Okay, now we'll get the top part of our case. Again, a few little scuffs and some discoloration, but otherwise in good shape. Well, it's kind of odd the damage to that plastic piece inside because there's no indication of a drop or a knock from the outside of the case. So it could have been, you know, in another container and it was just dropped a good distance and there was enough shock from the weight of the uh, spindle motor to have caused a problem. Then I decided I would leave this marker on there. It's part of the history of the unit. And who knows how many years that's been on there. Now we've got our battery cover. I made a little drawing here showing where all these foam pieces are in their size so I can do something relatively close. I've got a roll of some thin foamy stuff here, which is probably a lifetime supply. So I guess the next thing to do is just to clean all this foamy stuff off of here. I'll try just flooding that with a little alcohol. That looks like it's kind of dissolving that. A few minutes of quality time rubbing on this. Get all that nasty stuff off of there. I'm just finishing up here with that little Q-tip to kind of get all the crumbles out of the corners. This didn't take too long to do, just a few minutes. Bit of a disaster with this cover. 
the alcohol I put on here it leaked under there and it was only in contact for you know maybe 30 seconds to a minute but it marked up the surface you know I've used a little alcohol in a rag to wipe some sticky stuff off the other parts of the case without a problem but I guess being in contact for that long has a deleterious effect you notice this side looks better I took a little of this Novus number no. two fine scratch remover and just polished up this side so I'll go ahead and do this now that's not going to make it perfect but it'll blend in a little better it won't stand out as bad as this and you know the whole case is imperfect so uh, you got to have a light touch though because it does bring up some of the silver paint now I've got a piece of our self adhesive foam cut out here and everything marked up got the side pieces and the center piece Not too shabby. These ones on the side are a little harder to do. Yeah, yeah it's really, really crooked. It is less crooked, but still crooked. Okay. That's fairly straight. It's a little crookedish but it'll do the job to keep the batteries and the cover from wobbling around. We kind of got our blotched up paint job smoothed out so it looks okay. It looks as, about as good as the rest of the unit now. So I'd say well, we're in business. We just need to go back and finish up that broken mechanism. Since we went ahead and took this thing all apart, we can go ahead and do a very good cleaning on the interior here. This is just a dry Q-tip. I'm just picking up the schmaltz that's on the inside here. Now I've got some of my 409 on a Q-tip. Try to get the pinch roller here. Some rubbers have a negative reaction with alcohol and some don't. Most is perfectly fine. Now with our pinch roller cleaned up, I've got some alcohol on this Q-tip. I'm going to go over the heads. Not forget the erase head here. Okay. And we can go ahead and get the tops of the keys here and all these little cracks and everything with some uh, WD-40 or WD-40 Formula 409 on a rag. And uh, then we'll be ready to finish fixing this plastic bit over here and putting it all back together. Well, time for a little reconstructive surgery here. So the idea is we're going to take a little baking soda well, apply it just a thin layer where there's a missing chunk. I'll put a drop of super glue on that, let that set up, and keep uh, doing that till we get it built up to the desired level. The baking soda and the super glue have a bit of a chemical reaction, and they form a, a hard material that you can build up and file down and things like that. It works pretty well. I wrapped a little cap tan tape around the needle from my little hypodermic dealy there and uh, just to make kind of a form so we're not filling in the hole too much and now we should be able to get started it's going to be kind of hard to do this and film at the same time I think but we'll endeavor to do it this uh, wire here is actually heat staked in place along there which is why I haven't moved it oh. that was a lot of baking soda
didn't want all of that in there. Yeah. And the idea is we build this up in layers until we get it to where we need it. That's a general idea. So I'm going to continue on with this. And once I get all these little crevices filled up, I'll just let it set for a few hours and do some filing. Well, how did we do with our baking soda and super glue fix? It doesn't look too bad. Um, I was playing around and I colored it black with a Sharpie marker. I'll put a picture up here of what it looked like before I did that. Um, yeah, Sharpie markers always look purple next to real black, but it does make it look a little better. Uh, this isn't the most attractive repair, but it's functional. It took several minutes with a file and even a Dremel tool to get some of the uh, more built up areas uh, whittled down. So this would set in here like it's supposed to, like this. And so I got that all you know, fitting nicely, and I thought, well, I'll put this back together, but I hadn't done a really good job at keeping my screw separated. So what do you do then? Because, you know, all of us run into this problem. Well, what I do, let's see if I can zoom out here. Okay, so I've got my screws over here kind of grouped in the ones that are like. Well, these two with the sleeves on here, these were the ones for the, the motor. Uh, the motor gives them like that. And, you know, not only are they machine screws, but, you know, it's kind of obvious they're different. And I can remember taking those out. So that wasn't real difficult. Then we've got this one little tiny machine screw. And the only place it can go is in this little hole right here through this plastic down into the metal plate. It's the only hole that size. Again, not too tough there. And then we've got two different lengths of screws that go into plastic that are otherwise the same. So I puzzled over this for a little bit and I realized that one goes here and one goes here. One's going through this metal bracket, one's going through the board. The board in the metal is about the same thickness. The other two are going through the plastic into the top cover. Well the plastic is thicker than the PCB in the metal so it stands to reason that the longer screws will go through the plastic and the shorter screws go here and here. And I also I checked a few of the caps on this board for ESR they're fine there's no signs of leaking. Uh, I wouldn't expect something like this to have run long enough or hot enough for the capacitors to be a problem. Okay, so I guess to put this back together, we can start with attaching the repaired plastic piece. Oops, Jeffrey, can I see? I just give you this big lecture about what screws go where, and I try to put a plastic screw where this unique little machine screw goes. Holy. Okay, get him started. And one of our shorter plastic screws goes there. Okay, now we need to get our motor slipped up in there. Like that, okay. Okay, got the motor in there. The wires are routed like they should be. Uh, we need to put this switch on that post where it lives. And we gotta get our belt back up on this pulley where it goes. 
So I got those screws put in. I forgot to point out this screw, which is a unique machine screw with a large head. I had screwed it into the, the post there when I took it apart. Um, now I need to put on the tape counter belt, which is this one. I labeled it as B1. I'll put a list of these below. And I went ahead and popped the top off this and cleaned it up since we had it all apart anyhow. And I think all we need to do to get this guy back home where it goes is kind of tip the keys in like that and rotate it down. Oh, very nice. That wasn't too hard at all. Okay, another screw I forgot to point out, but it was rather unique is this post here which goes down in that hole like that and then you need just the right flat blade screwdriver so it reaches both sides there one of them goes here okay yeah and the other goes there you can kind of see mark on the plastic where the screw head was. I did notice that on these marks from the belt a little denatured alcohol on a q-tip uh, softened those up. I didn't go real crazy because I didn't want to leak any through here and mar up the gray plastic like we did there. Like I did I guess I should say. It just sits down in there like that. And then this. Just rotates like that. Perfect. I've got a tape here that's mostly blank. It's the one I tried to use on that last pocket computer. So let's rewind it. There we go. Stop. I always think stop should be over here. Ah, I just noticed somebody put white marks where they wanted to, to set it for their computer, I'm guessing. Okay, so we'll press record. I'm going to watch in here for the leader to run out, and I'll just keep jabbing away, and we'll see how well the built-in microphone does. And it's not doing anything. Fast forward. Oh no. Oh, we got a button problem here. I was a little hasty in putting this back together. That little switch there, the one we had loose, is what's triggered when we do a fast forward like that or rewind. And you notice I've got this one wire in the wrong spot. And there's also a little crack there. So whatever broke this, crack that switch as well. So I'll need to take this loose and glue that and put it back in place. And when I pulled it apart the second time, Another piece of the broken plastic from here fell out, and I, I shook this pretty good. I looked all over and didn't find it, but just from playing with it there a few minutes, that fell out. So I'll get this switch fixed, and then we'll give it another shot. I think mechanically we've got this all sorted out, uh, but I noticed that when I tried to play a cassette, it made no noise. Uh, in fact, there was no noise from the built-in speaker at all. And I was really surprised when I plugged in some external speakers I have here. I'm going to power this with an external power supply so you hear it running. So there we can get it to be quiet if we 
whack on it in the right spot. So um, I'm guessing the jolt that broke everything has broken a component or probably loosened up a solder joint or something like that. So we'll have to get this board loose and take a look. When I got this board loose, I noticed this switch here, which is supposed to connect just here. So as you move it to play and record or whatever, that switch is moved. And since I had this board loose to get in here to the belts, I bet that might not have been on the right place. And luckily, the schematics were in the back of the manual. And we can see the switch showing up here, going to the record playhead, to the microphone, and it is here as well which is going into this amplifier IC and here and here and here. So this one switch, switch one, does all sorts of stuff. So if that was not in the right place, um, it wouldn't have been doing the right thing. So I'll try to put this back together and get the board down on top of the switch actuator the correct way and try to make sure it works and then we'll see what happens. It took some fiddling to get that in the correct place. I wound up uh, putting it in record mode with the switch slid all the way that way and was able to see it through this little hole right here, which is, I guess, why that's in the circuit board. And then get the board down in place and secure it with the two screws. Now, I didn't see that hole was there originally because remember this piece goes there and it was soldered in place and I didn't remove it because I didn't think I needed to. Remember our busted switch here? I wound up uh, just super gluing it in place uh, to the little metal piece where it goes. That's not an ideal solution but it will work and um, if it ever does have to come off of there it will be possible to get it off of there and just clean up there remnants of the super glue off the middle with a little acetone so out of lots of possible bad choices that's probably the least obnoxious now with our switch in the correct place what happens if we press play i don't know if you could hear that but i heard just a little crackling from the speaker Oh yeah, now we're getting sound out of the speaker. It sounds like we need to clean our volume pot. And don't gasp. I'll hold this close to the pickup bed. Yep, okay. So we do indeed have it making some noise now. So I need to clean that volume pot. And put the, the backpack on it in the lid so we can try to play tape and see what happens. Now to clean our pots, we've got some deoxid and I am going to carefully squirt some in each pot. We're trying not to make a mess. I can hear a little background noise, which is probably being swapped out by the power supply fan. But the scratchiness is gone. Okay. Put the cassette in. We'll try recording. I'm going to watch it get past the leader here. This is a test of the emergency JeffCast system. This is only a test. This particular tape sticks right at the beginning. That's static from the leader.
Okay, it was just there, but that was awfully weak toast. And it might just be the condition of this microphone. The microphone could have been damaged when it fell as well. What should be a good tape. This is a cassette my dad and I used when studying for our amateur radio licenses back in the early 80s. Uh, where's the volume control? Right there. Okay. L N R W B C G. Keep trying this until you can copy it well. If you have trouble with a particular letter, try listening for just that letter. Then go back and try to get every letter again. When you think you are ready, move on to the next few letters. It looks like fast forward and rewind are working well. I'm a little concerned about the recording, so I'll have to try it with an external mic and see what happens. I did try it with an external microphone and it didn't help. I got to thinking it must have something to do with that little switch on the circuit board since we had playback now and not record. I took it back apart and I noticed that the actuator for the switch, which I've circled here, was bent. So I bent it back to 90 degrees and then tried it again. This next part is over modulated, but you'll get the idea that it does work now. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Well, now it's time to move on to our Sharp uh, CE-152 tape deck. I've got the map I've made of how the original belts went on. I wasn't quite sure on two of these what length they were. There was a couple different choices in that size range, so I bought one of each. And for the counter, there was only one choice. So when we find out which belt indeed that it takes, I will put that information in the description that is down below. Now to get this out of the case, you need to be sure and press in the tape counter. And try to lift that up, this little rubber piece here. Yeah. Wiggle it out. It's kind of cracked a little bit on both sides from the tape counter hitting there. This has a little wear or something on the silver paint. Yeah, it's definitely some wear right here. But in general, it's in pretty good shape. I think I'm going to go ahead and wipe down the exterior. Just to kind of do a, a rough job on it. I put all the old belts in the battery compartment. So, belt one has no knots. Uh, belt two has two knots. Belt three has three knots. So I could tell them apart later if I needed to. This also had a little foam in here that's deteriorated. This other stuff is just like a real thin felt, so that's no problem, but we can cut some foam out of that other sheet that we used for the Radio Shack recorder. And we'll have a look in here. As I recall, these are all the same size. Oh no. These are machine screws, two of them that are the same size, and these are plastic screws which are the same size as each other. Okay, and that just comes off of there. That was nicely designed. I don't see any schmaltz in here. No sign of leaking in the battery compartment, which is good. There's a little discoloration here, but that's just the glue that these rubber feet were glued in with. There's a little something here. Uh, which 
which is kind of in the battery compartment area, but there's nothing really underneath it in here. This also has an RF shield of sorts in here. And our belts go in this area. There's some rubber bushings here on the motor mount. Those still seem to be okay. So if I'm remembering right, we need to pull that screw out. We can remove him, set him aside. And we've got one screw here to hold this board in place. And it's got a little star washer on it. Okay. Okay, now let's just slide that out of the way a little bit. I kind of like would like to get to the rest of the mechanism a bit to clean the inside. Well, it's pretty clean in there. This looks like a very similar mechanism design overall to the radio shack. Trying to figure out how to get this board slid most of the way off in order to get to where all the belts go and check everything out. Now this also has a little switch in here. He's hiding right there. And right there is the hook it goes over. And there is the power switch. Uh, you can just see it there. Similar ideas. Yeah, this is not dirty on this side. So I don't think I need to take this apart anymore. Uh, belt 3 is the bottom belt. It's either 7.4 inches long or 7.0. I think I'll try the longer one first. And if it is uh, too loose, then we'll put the shorter one on there. And like the Radio Shack unit, we've got this one little screw here. That plate slides out of the way. It'll give us access to the flywheel. And then I've got my map here of how the belt goes on. So, this goes on the bottom of the flywheel, like that. It goes around here, but we can do that last. And then that one. Uh, I think we should have gone with the shorter belt. That is a little too floppy. Okay. Let's rotate that around by hand. Since this is a, a square profile belt, it will rotate itself around to, to align properly. Yeah, that's a lot better deal there. Okay. A lot better deal. And our belt number one, which is the counter belt. This is kind of hard to show you. It goes from here to here. So this is the play cap stand. So the counter is only driven when it's in play. Which is kind of weird, which means the counter won't go backwards. That seems rather odd. Okay, that is where it goes. Um, I'll show you the picture on the screen. I don't know what I was thinking about it only being driven one direction. Of course, whichever side of the tape is being driven, both cap stands are going to move. So, ah. Uh. Okay, there we go. Just had to use the right end of the spring hook. That is why these things come in so handy for things like this. 
Okay. And then we've got our final belt, which just goes from here to here. It's the actual drive belt. It's either an 8.6 inch or 8.9 inch. And I think I'm going to try the shorter one first this time. Like that, that's not too tight, it's not too loose. 8.6 inch it was. All right, so now we know which three belts we need to use for this deck. Excellent. Now we've got to get the switch, which is what this mess here is with all these uh, pins sticking up through there. We need to get it lined up with the mechanism below. So we don't goof that up like we did on the last one. When I say we, of course, I mean me. And there is a hole here to see through with that shield remote. I can see it. So if we slip this board in place and look down in there, I can see the little part of the mechanism holding on to there. Oh, you know what? We forgot to put the metal bracket back on here. Yeah, that's important. So what happens if we hit play? Watch that down through that hole. Okay, that stays in place. That's what it should do. And we need to put a tape in there to get the record mechanism to work. If we hit record now, that moves the switch. Excellent. So we'll go ahead and get this board started back in position. And slip this guy on there. Okay, that still moves nice and easy. Okay, got our little piece of tape there that keeps the wires in place. And I took some uh, copper tape. It's copper with a conductive adhesive on one side. And I kind of fixed up here where that was corroded. That way we've got conduction all the way from the screw to the rest of this metallized surface. And I Clean the rust off the washer and put a dribble of deoxid on there to hopefully keep it from wanting to corrode again. I think that was probably just some galvanic corrosion. You got two different metals mechanically bonded together for years. A little difference of potential. Some minute current flowing and it causes corrosion. Got all of that back together. Now we need to clean the workings on the other side. You can kind of see, you might just be able to see a little dark area right here that's from the belts, kind of like the other one did. As they aged, they must have outgassed. So I won't fasten this one down, but we'll go ahead and put it on there. And we'll see if we can get this door off of here. Yep, okay. Now I've got easy access to in here to clean this up. There we go. Okay. nice now this has some spots on it I don't know what that's from it just looks like something is that could be even from like oil from fingerprints has gotten into the the paint after all the years so 
this has a little tab on each side here. I'll just push in one side at a time. There we go. We've got our battery lid here to clean up. I'm not going to try to use any alcohol on this because I'm thinking that the silver paint might react poorly to it. Just like it did on the Radio Shack unit. I'll just carefully peel this back with a small flat blade screwdriver. I just moistened this Q-tip with some alcohol. Get the rest of that adhesive out of there. Okay, I've got a piece of that foam cut. By the way, the stuff like this that I use, the foam and whatnot, I'll put links in the description down below. I'll see a section called links. And you can find the stuff there. If it's from Amazon, it'll be an associate link, which means that, you know, Amazon gives me a penny or two. If you place an order, it doesn't cost you anymore. There we go. Now we've got us a nice little piece of foam in there for the batteries. And I think we'll put in these two screws before we try to test it. Okay. Do, 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 do. And wow, that's an annoying sound. Makes me wonder if that switch is in the right position. Let's uh Huh, the cap stand's moving, but the tape's not. Well, hell's bells. Huh. Well, that's an interesting problem. I guess both of these tape decks are going to give us fits. Well, that was a rather curious problem we had there. Uh, the primary issue was that this plastic reel here had cracked with age and popped off. Uh, when I first tried to put it on there, I was just pushing down and the, the shaft was actually moving so it wasn't seating all the way. And when I put the tape in, and it was actually driving the tape backwards and I couldn't figure out how that was possible. I was really befuddled for a while. And that's this little sprocket right here. And what was happening is when that was being pushed up, it was being pushed up into the bottom of this idler wheel right here, which then caused the gear to run backwards. Now, how weird is that? Once I figured that out and I was able to hold this part and push that back on there, uh, then everything was fine. I did, um, before pushing that back on there, I glued it with some super glue and let that set for a while and pushed it on there. And it seems to be fine now. So I did a bit of looking around on the, the internet. And of course, you know, all these reels are different from machine to machine. So I'm not sure how I'd go about making another one of these. Unless I machined it from scratch. I also cleaned that multi-position switch that was in here like on the other one and the two pots uh, with the deoxid like we did on the first deck and spent some time getting that switch adjusted both making sure the actuator was 90 degrees and positioning the board just right. There's enough play in this board that it can affect the switch operation. 
Got all that done and it seems to be working okay now. Put our sticky tape in here. You can hear the power supply in the background. Okay, I don't know where I have this tape right now. Test, one, two, three. Uh, yeah, so that was the end of something I recorded. Um, I've noticed on both of these decks that when you're in fast forward or rewind, what you get is a battery indication here. It should be nice and bright. If it's a dim, the batteries are low. And when you're recording, it's like a little uh, signal strength indicator or a VU meter in an LED form. So that's kind of interesting. So this is working now. I need to put the screws back in. And then I thought to wrap this up, we would actually try using these to save and load programs to a little pocket computer and see how that goes. Here is our little test setup. It's kind of a multicultural affair. We've got a Casio cassette interface, a Tandy pocket computer, and a sharp cassette deck with an RCA cassette tape. Uh, the remote functionality of this cassette interface is not working very reliably, so we're just going to make use of the pause button over here. If I turn the pocket computer on, And here where you can see that a little better. Okay. And if we go to programming mode and list, you can see there's a simple program. 10, A equals 5, 20 go to 10. I'm using this as a test program for something else I'm working on. Okay. I will press record over here. It's not doing anything because I've got the pause on. Save if I can spell. We'll call this Hey. And I'm going to release pause and press enter. There we go. Now I started the counter at about one, so I was past the leader. There we go. Okay. And we can do a new here. And we just erased our program. So if we type in load, hey, and hit enter and release pause. If all the cassette gods are with us, it'll find the program and load it. Hey, it found the program. It says PF Hey. And we're done. That pause button is handy for some applications. And now if we do a list, we can see our programs in there. So we've got saving and loading working. I've tried this on both cassette decks actually. And it works fine. Um, this interface just came with um, this really beat up PB200 here. Um, which needs a lot of work. And I just found out that the, the remote relay isn't working right all the time, or it might be a break here in the plug somewhere. I'm not quite sure yet. So that'll be a repair for another day. But hey, we've got two cassette decks all fixed up. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. This has actually taken uh, about a week or a little more uh, working on these and fits and starts to get both of them fixed up. The Realistic Mini Set 9 was full of surprises with some mechanical damage from a drop without any evidence of that on the outside. Had a little disaster with some alcohol on the cover there, but we kind of got that fixed up. And 
this is working fine. Our Sharp CE152 is relatively simple, just replacing the belts, but these broken black plastic reels really threw me for a loop there. I've got them both glued now, and they're working uh, for how long? Who knows? Uh, maybe someday I'll be able to find a replacement for them, or I may have to try to cast some new ones out of castable plastic or machine some or, or something. We'll see if it gets to that point. And we even got to try out this little Casio cassette interface here. I found out it mostly works, but it's got a few problems too. By the way, I forgot to mention this little guy. You'll see this a lot of times with pocket computers. It is a shorting plug for the microphone input. So you plug this into the microphone input and you press record and you can record over the tape and get dead silence that way. So these are pretty nifty. So if you see one of these, now you know what it is. If you have any questions or comments, hey, just let me know in that comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone who helps support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. I really appreciate it. You help keep this channel going. Well, until next time, bye.